Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Real Science Lecture Series. My name is Scott Sorrell, Director of Global Marketing at Balchem. The cost to raise an animal from birth to production can be significant, and investing in an animal with chronic lung issues can be a losing proposition. Today, we welcome Dr. Terry Olivet from the University of Wisconsin School of Veterinary Medicine to discuss her work using ultrasound to determine lung health in calves. Dr. Olivet is a veterinary epidemiologist and board-certified large animal internist at the University of Wisconsin. After graduating from the College of Veterinary Medicine at Cornell University in 2004, Dr. Olivet practiced in a predominantly mixed large animal clinic in northern New York. She returned to Cornell University in 2007 and completed a residency in large animal medicine between 2008 and 2011. In 2014, she completed her doctoral studies at the University of Guelph by validating lung ultra ultrasonography as a means of diagnosing respiratory disease in dairy calves and then joined the faculty at the UW-Madison School of Veterinary Medicine. Currently, as an associate professor in food animal production medicine, Dr. Olivet continues to advance the academic, veterinary, and professional dairy industry's awareness and understanding of lung ultrasonography as a means of diagnosing and monitoring cattle health and the varied impacts on the intervention interventions on the dairy farm. Dr. Olivet, the floor is now yours. All right, well, thank you. It's great to be with everyone this morning. Um, and talk about something that I have become more and more passionate about over the last decade as we've learned more about how we can use this tool using lung ultrasound to monitor um, cattle health, particularly right now the emphasis is in young cow health, but this is a tool that can be used in adult cows as well. And today I'm going to really um, be talking about you know, how do we keep these animals breathing easier using the lung ultrasound. And, and, and by, by breathing easy, what I mean is how can we detect disease sooner. And I want to show you, the audience, some, some different examples of using videos, using farm data to show you how, what subclinical pneumonia really looks like, how early we can detect it compared to clinical disease, and kind of what it means for you when you walk out into your barn when you hear a cough or see a sick calf. So um, hopefully I'll be able to provide some answers for you today and give you some food for thought to think about how what you're doing right now to provide oversight of these animals in your in your operation. So I think many of us are familiar with the phrase, the eyes are the window to the soul. This is a Shakespeare phrase from a long time ago. And in my mind, with young calves, young dairy cows particularly, I see the lungs as the window to calf health management. So when things go wrong in the lungs, it tells me that there's something going wrong in their environment. And I don't just mean the ventilation or the facilities, but everything around um, the life of that young calf, right? I think the lungs are what I call an indicator organ. So when I see respiratory disease in a calf operation or in a calf bar or in young stock, it really tells me that there is a management failure happening, right? The lungs and respiratory disease is a symptom of management failure. So I, I will talk a little bit about the bacteria and the viruses that are involved in respiratory disease, but I tend to look at respiratory disease more holistically as a symptom of management failure. For instance, I'm gonna list several things here um, that when they go wrong, we can see it manifest as pneumonia in the lungs. So. If you have failure passive transfer, we tend to see higher rates of pneumonia in those calves. If you have diarrhea in your young calves, we tend to see pneumonia a week or so later. If you have septic calves, we end up seeing it in the lungs. If you have poor nutrition, a dirty environment, cold stress, even heat stress, we can see it manifest as pneumonia in the lungs. And more often than not, it manifests as subclinical pneumonia, which means the the lungs are abnormal, but the calf externally looks completely normal. And, and because of this sort of mantra, I suppose I would say, um, I've developed something called the Wean Clean philosophy, which means if we are managing calves properly, you know, to the best, um, you know, to what they need, they are going to get to and through the weaning period with clean lungs, right? 
So if we get calves to 60 days, 70 days, 80 days, however old they are when you're weaning them, and they have nice clean lungs at that point, it tells me that things are working in your program, right? So just keep that tucked in the back of your mind. In the next few slides, I'm going to talk a bit about the airway defense mechanisms, get into a little bit about the organisms that are involved, and, and, and really focus in on, on coughing calves. Because, you know, for a long time, coughing is kind of that hallmark symptom that a calf has respiratory disease. Of course, they can have a fever, they can be breathing heavy, they can be depressed, they might have droopy ears or a snotty nose. But I think cough is that one thing that we always associate with, oh, she probably need to treat her. She probably has pneumonia. And I'm going to get into a little bit of what the lungs look like in those coughing, coughing calves. So um, just to start with those airway defense mechanisms, thinking about how that calf is built in order to protect its lungs from disease. So in this slide, um, at the top part where it says particle entrapment, you can think of this as starting at the, at the nose, at the nares, so the nostrils and the nasal passages. And the arrow goes all the way down into the deep into the lungs. And so all the way along that path between the opening of their nose and their nostrils down into their lungs, there's different mechanisms in place. Um, you have little hairs in your nose. The calves have little hairs in their nose that are going to help trap particles to prevent them from going down in the lower airway. You've got what we call the mucociliary apparatus and the cough mechanism. This is an, uh, a little function, a little escalator basically on the surface of the respiratory tract that kind of constantly moves all the bad things that get down in the lower airway up and then, we can, and then the calf can cough them out. Um, down in the lungs, there are products called innate defense proteins. So there's a proteins that can help. Some of them have antibacterial properties. You've got cells down there, these alveolar macrophages. You've got neutrophils that can come in when an invader or pathogen has gotten down there. And the animal can then, you know, create that immune response to get on top of any um, infection or inflammation that's going on down in the lower airway. So there's pathways all the way down the respiratory tract to try to help prevent bacteria and viruses from getting down there and to deal with them once they do get down there. And so what I'm looking at here is just kind of a, um, the side view of a calf. So we can, I'm going to talk about different parts of the respiratory tract. I just want to show you what I'm specifically talking about. Because when we talk about um, where pathogens are, where bacteria are, it becomes helpful to kind of think um, and visualize exactly where in the calf we're talking about. Because you'll often hear me, I'm going to talk about deep nasal pharyngeal swabs. We'll talk about trach washes a little bit. But when we're taking deep nasal pharyngeal swabs, if you've done this or your veterinarian has done this, or maybe if you're not familiar with it, um, that's a technique where we take a long, long swab and we're going to go through the nasal passage, through the nostril, and we're going to sample the back of the throat here. So deep in the back of the throat, just before the opening to the trachea. Um, number two here is that trachea. And if we go down that trachea or the windpipe, that's heading down into the lungs. And so there's pretty good work that suggests bacteria and viruses that live back here in the nasopharynx are pretty similar to what we would find down in the lungs if we were sampling the lungs, okay? That's important because you have to think about if you're a veterinarian or if you're a veterinarian on this call and you're taking respiratory samples, if we're taking upper airway samples, we wanna make sure that we sample an, an area that's gonna be most representative of what's going on in the lungs where the primary disease is happening. And that nasopharynx is a very good place to do that. The nasal passages itself, we can take samples from there, but the bacteria, the organisms we isolate from the nasal passages, it does not correlate nearly as well with what we would find in the lungs. So it's not as reliable an indicator if we're trying to determine a pathogen profile for what's causing respiratory disease in your calves and your farm. So what I wanna, what I did was I went through um, and looked at some research and Again, trying to focus in on what, what, it, what does a coughing calf really mean, right? And there's a paper here from a few years ago now, it's from 2010, where they actually looked at the cough sound description in relation to respiratory disease in calves. Again, remember with lung ultrasound, the whole premise of this talk is that we're thinking about how can we diagnose disease sooner? Okay, what does it mean when we see clinical signs, right? Those visible signs of disease. So we're going to focus on coughing here. And in this 
um, study, they had 12 weaned dairy calves that had clinical respiratory disease, which means they were visibly affected. So they had some clinical sign associated with respiratory disease. And in particular, they all had a positive cough. Okay, so you can, you know, these calves, you walk in and they cough as soon as they see you. And what they found in this study was that these calves um, were very highly likely to have pastorella multocida, um, most commonly, and more common than the viruses that we can see here, BRSV, BHV, PI3, BVD. Hopefully, if you vaccinate for respiratory disease, these four viruses look very familiar to you because it's going to be in most of your modified live vaccines that you're using in these calves, okay? But more often than the viruses, these calves had pastorella multocida. It's going to be the most common bacteria um, that we see in, in young calves with respiratory disease. Okay, so take home that I want to tell you here is that those calves that have a cough all have some respiratory pathogen associated in their respiratory system. Okay, so, so if you hear a cough, calf, cough, <laughs> it's hard to say fast. If you hear a calf coughing, it is highly likely that you will find a respiratory pathogen associated with that, okay? But then the next thing I wanted to know was, well, what do those calves, what do their lungs look like? Because just because a calf has a respiratory pathogen associated in its respiratory system, does that mean that they actually have pneumonia, all right? And so this is um, a study that was done in, Oh boy, um, just last year here in 2022, where they looked at the differences in the association of cough, other clinical signs, and they compared it to ultrasound um, lung consolidation in a mixture of calves. So dairy calves, veal calves, and beef calves. So this is a study out of Europe. And what they found when they looked at clinical disease versus lung ultrasound um, was that cough was the best indicator, right? So in that last study said, if calves are coughing, weaned calves have a cough, They've got pathogens there, more bacterial than viruses, but they've got pathogens. This study says if they cough, they are highly likely to have pneumonia, okay? Um, but it wasn't um, extremely sensitive, okay? So cough out of nasal discharge, ocular discharge, ear position, um, cough was the best clinical indicator to say that they had pneumonia on the ultrasound but only 37%. So out of 100 calves that had pneumonia on the ultrasound, cough only found 37 of them, okay? So still not a very good test for finding calves that truly have pneumonia, okay? All right, so that's what that's saying over here on the left-hand side in the red. Coughing calves have ultrasonographic lung consolidation, which means pneumonia, but most consolidated calves don't cough, right? It's not a good early warning tool. And what I want to show you is some real life lung ultrasound data from a herd here in Wisconsin that does routine lung ultrasound scores, right? And I'll get into the details a little bit more about what these lung scores mean. But for right now, I just want you to know that a score zero means the lungs are completely normal. A score one means they're very mild changes. They might be a little bit associated with viral disease, um, but typically quite mild changes. Score two through five means that calf has um, bacterial pneumonia. A two is very mild bacterial pneumonia and five is very severe bacterial pneumonia, okay? You can see the number of animals that we scored and the percentage of animals that had each of those lung scores. So most of the calves out of these um, two, over 2,000 animals um, were in that score two or score three category if they weren't normal. And what I'm also showing you is the number of calves that were coughing in each of those categories and the percent of calves in that category um, that had a cough, right? And what we found here is that, yes, if they had a cough, they were 2.1 times as likely to have pneumonia, okay? But when we looked at the whole picture, again, looked at the sensitivity, so of all of the calves, um, how sensitive was cough in identifying them with pneumonia? The sensitivity was only 9.7%, so about 10%. So in our real life, you know, commercial herd, um, routine lung ultrasound scanning that we're doing, if a calf was coughing, highly likely that it had pneumonia, twice as likely to have pneumonia than a calf that wasn't coughing. Um, but 
only 10% of the calves with pneumonia were coughing. Okay, so somewhat similar to that last study um, where if they cough, they're likely to have pneumonia, but if they don't cough, it really tells us nothing. Okay, and again, it's about that subclinical pneumonia. Subclinical means they don't have any visible signs of disease. And so it should make perfect sense that there are a lot of calves out here with pneumonia that don't cough, okay? So I'm going to show you some videos here to kind of highlight that difference between clinical and subclinical pneumonia. So we've got three calves here, and I think about this as a bit of an iceberg effect. So, you know, we talk about iceberg type diseases. A lot of times we have mastitis, right? Subclinical mastitis. You have a lot more subclinical mastitis than you do clinical mastitis. Yoni's disease. You have a lot more subclinical Yoni's disease than you do um, sub a lot more subclinical Yoni's disease than you do clinical ketosis. There's a lot more subclinical ketosis than you have clinical ketosis. And now that we have ultrasound available to us, we can now say the same thing for pneumonia. We have much more subclinical BRD, subclinical pneumonia, that iceberg underneath the water compared to clinical BRD. Okay, now we have a tool that we can actually use to find it because we're not going to rely on what the calf looks like, but instead we're going to rely on what the lungs are telling us. And so these three calves, this calf on top, this is a five-week-old calf. This is pretty textbook respiratory disease, right? We've got a calf, if you were to feel its top line is very thin. You can see it's um, when it stands to the side, it's very... Um, has its head and neck stretched out, its ears are droopy, it's breathing labored, it does not want to move. This calf is very sick and there's usually no trouble in saying, okay, this calf probably has pneumonia. Well, then we have this calf in the middle. You'll notice, hopefully the video is playing at the same time as mine, um, that I just induced a cough in this calf. This is a 10 week old calf. Um, you see, she's got droopy ears. I'm inducing a cough in here. She coughs multiple times. So based on our University of Wisconsin calf health score, the clinical respiratory score, she is positive for clinical respiratory disease. She has multiple inducible coughs and she has bilaterally or she has both ears are droopy. Okay, So she has visible signs of respiratory disease. The reason I'm looking at this calf on that day at my visit to the farm is because um, she's so small. So this calf actually weighs 105 pounds. And I told you she was 10 weeks old. She should be just about as big as this heifer here in the back. At 10 weeks old, you know, if they're growing according to our gold standards, where we want them to double their birth weight um, by eight weeks of age, this calf should probably weigh at 10 weeks old, she should probably weigh around 210 pounds. So she is severely stunted. Okay? She has clinical respiratory disease today. Okay. And so one might think that well, she probably is a chronic pneumonia, and that's why she's so small. Well, the calf on the bottom is a three-week-old calf. And once the video catches up, you can see I accidentally hit the slow-mo slow, slow -mo button for, for extra dramatic effect here. But this calf is sucking on my finger, chasing me around her pen, happy, 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 no cough, no nasal discharge, no droopy ears, no fever, just happy as a clam, all right? Well, I have the... I had the opportunity to, well, the first calf, the second calf needed to be euthanized, right? These were chronic, um, poor doing animals. So um, they were both euthanized and I necropsied those animals. Um, so you can see what their lungs look over on the right hand side of the screen. Um, this bottom calf here, although happy looking, I knew based on ultrasound that this calf had severe pneumonia or I was highly suspicious of it. This was very early on in our research on using lung ultrasound. And so because this calf was a research calf, we did euthanize this calf and do a necropsy so that we could confirm that what we saw in the ultrasound was indeed pneumonia. Okay, so what I want you to think about is if you had to pick which one of these three calves had the worst lungs, most of you would probably say one or calf two, calf one or calf two. Most people, unless they know it's a trick question, would never say that calf three has the worst lungs. And when we look over here on the right hand side and we see the lungs of each of these calves taken from the same day that video was taken, I'll orient you just so you really know what you're looking at here. 
we're looking at the right lung where the calf is laying on their left side. So the head would be over here to the right of the screen or the right of the image. The tail would be to the left of the image. The top of the picture would be like the spine and then the bottom of the image is the sternum. And so we've lifted the rib cage up and we're looking down into that right lung where we have one lung lobe that's completely consolidated. It's red and firm right here in front of the heart, which is located right here. We have a normal lung lobe right here, just behind the heart. Then we have a second lung lobe that's completely consolidated here behind the heart, and then more normal lung up here towards the back. So for this first calf with two lung lobes completely consolidated like that, because each of these lung lobes is roughly about 6% of the mass of the whole lung, we can say that there's 12% um, of the lung affected in this first calf. Okay, hopefully that makes sense to you. Then we go to this middle calf who looks like she's got chronic stunting pneumonia. And we look at her lungs and we only see a few small, what I would call lobular lesions. So maybe one or 2% of the lung is affected. Right? I call the, the first calf has lobar pneumonia where the whole lobe is affected. Okay? Second calf has a lobular pneumonia, very mild pneumonia, only one or 2% of the lung affected. And then we come to that third calf. And again, we have one lung lobe completely affected and a second lung lobe completely affected. So again, this calf is probably in that 12% uh, lung affected. So the first calf and the third calf have similar amounts of lung affected with pneumonia and look completely different clinically. So that's the take home. This third calf down here on the bottom, this is what subclinical pneumonia looks like, right? You can't pick them out, right? They are prey species. It's part of my rationale for why calves do this. They don't want to tell you they're sick, right? Way back when, when they were trying to prevent themselves from being chased down by some wild predator, they didn't want to give any indication that they were sick. Okay? I, I think that's probably why we see subclinical disease in these animals, because they are trying to hide the fact that they're not so fit. Right? And we can't shame farm employees, we can't shame veterinarians for not picking up on these clinically, because they just don't have clinical signs to tell you that they're sick, but yet they can have extremely abnormal lungs. When I talk about the scoring system that I use, um, I referred to it earlier as score zero uh, through score five. And I'll just show you what the lungs look like for each of these scores. So again, we're looking at the right lung oriented, just like I showed you in that previous slide, where for each image, the head would be to the right and the tail would be to the left. The spine is up at the top of the picture and then the sternum is down here. So we're looking into that right lung. Um, a score zero is going to be nice, spongy, um, pale, uh, pink lung. A score two is going to be that lung with very small patches of lobular lesion. This is a score two in the upper right-hand picture, which is just a slightly larger score two. So there is quite a bit of variability in a score two calf. You can have a few centimeters of disease, or you could have 10, 20, 30, or 40 centimeters of disease, okay, these red firm areas. A score three means that that calf has at least has one lobe that's completely consolidated. A score four means there's two lobes consolidated. And score five means that there's at least three lobes completely consolidated, all right? And when it comes to pneumonia in these young calves, these lobes, this pattern of disease is extremely repeatable, extremely um, uh, similar from calf to calf to calf when it comes to bacterial pneumonia. Bacterial pneumonia likes to start in this front lobe first um, in most calves. And then we see it in this lobe here, the right middle lobe. And then the lobe in between, we'll see it as well. So if there's one place that we're going to look to find pneumonia, it's going to be up here in the front of the heart, um, where the most common place to see pneumonia. Now, you'll notice there's not an ultrasound score one picture in here. And that's because in young dairy calves, we just don't see very many ultrasound score one lesions. That ultrasound score one is typically, it's going to be viral in nature, or it might be secondary to septicemia. It's a heavy, wet, rubbery lung. We call that interstitial pneumonia versus bronchopneumonia that we're seeing here. And in young dairy calves, we just don't see very much of that. Maybe one to two to three percent calves will have that kind of a pneumonia. 
if we do see that in a, in the dairy operation or in dairy calves, then we really got to start thinking about other diseases that mimic respiratory disease like salmonellosis, septicemia. Um, and, and again, yes, viral disease can do it. Um, if you happen to be raising bull calves that aren't vaccinated because they're going to go to a stud, then we might see a little more viral disease in those young animals. But for the most part, your dairy heifers that we're raising that are pretty well vaccinated, we don't tend to see a lot of that ultrasound score one disease. Um, and our work has shown that the sensitivity of lung ultrasound to find these lung lesions is in animals without subclinical disease, um, or even if they do have um, clinical signs, it's going to be greater than 88%. So that means, you know, if the animal looks sick, or even if the animal doesn't look sick, we're going to find at least 88 out of 100 of them with our lung ultrasound. Okay, so remember what we saw back a few slides ago about how sensitive the cough was. And we're much more sensitive or much more capable of finding calves with pneumonia when we use the lung ultrasound. Um, I think the sensitivity was about 35% with cough. Um, clinical signs were probably up around 60 to 65% sensitivity. So if a calf has multiple clinical signs, um, we can find 50, 60, 65 out of 100 of them. Okay, so hopefully you're getting a picture that the ultrasound is a much more sensitive tool. Um, if you're using, I'll just go back one slide to, to further emphasize this point of how sensitive lung ultrasound is. You know, we, we as veterinarians like to wear our stethoscope. And so um, how good is a stethoscope at finding these lesions? Well, the sensitivity of stethoscope is only about six to 10%. Okay, so using a stethoscope, we only find six to 10 calves out of 100 that have these lung lesions. Okay, so not very sensitive at all. So what am I looking at on the ultrasound? So here on the left, hopefully the video is playing for you. Just gonna show you what it looks like to ultrasound a young dairy calf. So this is a one man job. We restrain, we do the scan, we enter the data into an app that we have on our phone. Um, this is a student who I think this is his second day learning how to scan. By his third day, he's gonna be even faster. I expect to be able to scan about 30 to 40 calves an hour without a helper. With a helper, you can be up in the 70 to 80 calves an hour. This is a tool that's meant to be fast and meant to be done on large groups of calves in a short period of time. Okay, so we just get that calf in the corner, put some alcohol on the side of its chest, and then we use our ultrasound, the same ultrasound that your veterinarian uses to diagnose pregnancy in a cow, so using that rectal probe. And what we can see are the images shown here to the, to the right. I'm gonna pause this one on the right. And actually, I'll go back here. So if we look at the loop on the right, that's the normal lung. And I'm showing you, this is one lung lobe. Here's a second lung lobe, the same. Third lung lobe, fourth lung lobe, fifth lung lobe, back to the front. This is the whole scan, what you've just watched. It takes about 15 seconds um, to do a scan from the front to the back of a calf. And what I want you to appreciate on this video here, if I get to the right loop, is there are a lot of horizontal white lines. This bright white line is the surface of the lung. And then when we see horizontal white lines underneath it, that tells us that lung is air filled and that lung is normal. And that's going to be compared to the lung onto the left. So I'm going to get these in the anatomical correct location. Okay. So these two images that you're looking at here are anatomically in the same spot on two different calves. So we're looking at the lobe right in front of the in the heart. I see a vessel right here. Just the same vessel over here that tells me I'm looking at the cranial cranial lung lobe. And in the calf on the right, I see horizontal white lines. In the calf on the left that has bronchopneumonia or bacterial pneumonia, I now see the architecture of the lung. It's this gray kind of speckled appearance. I can see a blood vessel in the middle of the lobe that's pulsating um, in when the clip is live. And so I'll let this go and you can see here's the consolidation. There's some normal lung, here's consolidated lung, normal lung, consolidated lung, normal lung, consolidated lung, and then a big lobe of consolidation. So this calf I just showed you in that 10 second clip has three lung lobes that are completely consolidated. So it's a score five. Okay, so again, just so you can get a visualization of what the difference between abnormal and normal is between these two calves. 
Now, normal calves do have this structure here. This is the liver. So this is why ultrasounding takes some training because liver looks a lot like consolidated lung. All right, so we need to make sure we don't make that mistake. So that calf that I just showed you, that was an ultrasound score five. Here's that abnormal lung, abnormal lung, more abnormal lung, and more abnormal lung. So what I just showed you was this lung lobe, the right middle lobe, the fifth rib space, I showed you the fourth rib space, the third rib space, the second rib space, and the first row space. It's very systematic when we do a scan. I can tell you exactly what lobe is affected and how severely it's affected with the technique of ultrasounding that we do. That's why it's such a good indicator for pneumonia, okay? All right, so I just showed you a little bit of what the ultrasound looks like, the sensitivity of it. Um, we're gonna talk here in a little bit about treatments um, and some more information, but I did wanna point out here that because right, we're, we're detecting disease after it's already happened. And a lot of folks would say, well, you know, we need to be preventing it. It's why, you know, we, we need to make sure that it doesn't happen. Uh, and that's absolutely true. So even though I'm gonna focus on detection of disease here, prevention, everything you hear about maternity management, passive transfer hygiene, nutrition is absolutely critical, okay? And we're gonna get into that towards the end of this talk. Um, but because depending on the farm, 50 to 80 percent of cases can be subclinical for one to two weeks before we see them all right so we may not even understand the full extent of the problem if we're not looking for it okay if it takes us one to two weeks to identify pneumonia in a calf because we're waiting for them to look sick we're already one to two weeks behind getting them treated we're already one to two weeks behind getting a good response to treatment because they're already becoming chronic by the time we see them, okay? Failure to cure and relapse of those subclinicals to become clinical or relapse of the clinical cases after treatment can happen right underneath our nose um, because we're so late to be treating them when we're working just off clinical signs, all right? So the lung ultrasound, we can use that to see what you as veterinarians, you as producers might be missing right, in your system. Remember I said the lungs are an indicator of management failure. If we start looking at the lungs, you will get a better handle on what is going right in your operation and what is going wrong. Now, I put this little caveat up here um, about salmonella. Now, when I say 50 to 80 percent of calves are, are subclinical for a week or two before we see them, that's with typical pastorella pneumonia, the bacterial pneumonias, manheimia, mycoplasma, Salmonella, if you're dealing with um, Salmonella septicemia, Salmonella Dublin, Salmonella Newport typhimurium in young calves, these calves can really look sick. They look visibly ill. They look like they have respiratory disease. They're droopy. They're breathing heavy. They have a fever. They might be coughing. Oftentimes, those Salmonella calves, their lungs don't look that bad. Okay, so that changes a little bit of the relationship. Um, there are operations that do have a bigger salmonella issue than they do pastorella, but the ultrasound helps you and your veterinarian sort that out so you can manage it differently. All right. And when we are able to identify who is affected with disease more accurately, um, we can do something about it, right? So because I, I did a PhD in epidemiology, they told me I have to put some epidemiological equation on the screen at some point during my talk. So you guys are my witnesses that here is my, my epi um, snippet of the day. Um, what this equation says is that prevalence, so that's the amount of animals with existing disease, is roughly equivalent to the incidence or how fast they get disease times the duration of disease. Okay, let that sink in a little bit. How many calves currently have disease is related to how fast disease occurs and how long a calf has disease. So when we focus on prevention, we're going to reduce the speed at which disease occurs. So we're going to cut incidence, which is then going to drop prevalence. But if we get calves identified early, get them treated properly, we're going to, in theory, cut the duration of disease. Right? So if we can cut the duration of disease, that's also going to decrease prevalence. So both prevention and proper treatment 
are going to be associated with the level of overall disease that you have on the farm or in your operation, right? Effective treatment that reduces the duration of disease supports antimicrobial stewardship as well, right? We have more and more, prop, more, and more pressure to use antibiotics properly, and this is one way um, that we can ensure that we're doing that. All right. So to put this in practical terms, what does that mean for you? Think about in your own herd. This is just a simple example to put some numbers to it. So um, a lot of times calves, when we start looking with the ultrasound, calves will be developing pneumonia by week three of age. So between 14 and 21 days of age. And let's say for this operation, you get five new cases of BRD of pneumonia per week, right? So five cases, five cases, five cases, all the way up to weaning at week eight. So the middle row, this is uh, meant to show you a herd that has a good cure rate, meaning that 80% of their calves respond to treatment after the first time they're treated. So let's say we get all of these calves treated and 80% of them respond. So that means for the five new cases, four of them respond to treatment each week. So by the time we get to weaning, there's, there's going to be our five new cases, but because there's one chronic left over from each week, we've got five chronics. So 10 cases. For herds that have bad cure rates because they don't detect disease soon enough, let's say 40%, they're only going to cure two calves per week, which means that by the end of the weaning period or by week eight, they're going to have 15 chronics, all right, versus five chronics for that herd that has good treatment response. So I just want to use this to visually show you that if you get good treatment response, at weaning, you should have more calves weaning with clean lungs, again, which is our goal. If we can get them to wean with clean lungs, they are less likely to flare up after you wean them. Weaning is that stressful period where everything changes, right? Their diet changes, their facility changes, their friends change. They go from individual housing to group housing or small group housing to large group housing. Um, a lot of stress happens. And so if they have subclinical pneumonia, um, or anything brewing at that time, we add that stress to them and then they flare up and become clinical afterwards. So by getting them to that time period, to that transition period with cleaner lungs, we should have less problems in the post weaning period. And it helps again with this antimicrobial stewardship, right? If we're gonna treat calves, we better hope that we're actually fixing the problem in their lungs with our antibiotics. Otherwise, it's a lot of drug to use, it's a lot of labor to get them treated, and it's a lot of pressure from an antimicrobial standpoint when it comes to antibiotic resistance. All right. Um, so how do you know if you have some evidence of treatment failure in your operation? So some things that I think about, if you're treating a lot of calves multiple times, right? I don't know what the exact number is, but um, most literature you'd see would probably say that most, like on average, 25% or more get retreated. That's based on clinical disease. Uh, to me, I mean, we got to figure out what that number is exactly, but if you, you got to figure out what it is for you and your operation. But if you feel like you're treating too many calves for clinical disease, if you've got poor growth, if you have mortality due to respiratory disease. Um, mortality, you know, when it comes to respiratory disease, most calves don't die immediately from pneumonia, right? So keep in mind, it, it may be delayed weeks to months, all right, because it really takes chronic, chronic disease to kill a calf. So if you're getting deaths in your two, three or four month old calves, you may have to back up and look at your pre weaning age calves to figure out that it's actually respiratory disease starting earlier. That's causing death later on. Um, high prevalence of subclinical pneumonia at weaning. So if they're getting treated, but they're not responding and they're not weaning clean, um, or if you don't have good resolution with seven to 10 days after treatment of the first case of disease, right? So when I see these things, suggest to me that we have some um, evidence of treatment failures. Um, in addition, if you have a positive bacterial culture from lung tissue, so you do do a necropsy um, following treatment, that's another indicator of treatment failure. All right, I gotta keep track of my time here, guys, because I could keep you all day um, if I had the opportunity. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about respiratory disease and antibiotic therapy. So in general, this is just my little schematic to show you what, how I think about what we're doing when we treat these calves, right? So this calf in the upper left, big snotty nose, have clinical respiratory disease. We can see the pneumonia in this left lung here, this red firm tissue um, in multiple lobes. And there's gonna be bacteria down in that lung lobe um, that is causing the recruitment of white blood cells and which is results in this consolidation or this red firm lung tissue. 
right? So that bacteria, the reason we're giving an antibiotic, right, the therapeutic, um, is because we want to kill the bacteria that's down in the lung. And if we do that, and if we are successful in killing the bacteria down in the lung, or at least getting it to a level where then the body can take over and finish doing the job the rest of the way, the neutrophils or the white blood cells that are causing this consolidation, um, those will eventually go away. The lung can become re-aerated and become normal looking again, right? So if we are doing things right, this is what we should see. So this is proper treatment response. Right? So on the ultrasound, what this calf in the upper middle picture would look like is just a big consolidated lung lobe. And then once that calf has responded to its treatment, we should be able to expect to see normal lung on the ultrasound. Now, what we found over the last several years is that's just not always the case. So this is a challenge study where we infected calves with Pasteurella multacida, one of the most common bacteria to cause pneumonia. And we did this um, because we wanted to look at the effect of treatment. Um, and so we had 17 calves that were given ampicillin or polyflex. This was a BI-sponsored study for full transparency. And we had 11 calves um, that were treated with saline. And I know it's small, but you can see in here on the, on the x-axis of each of these figures, it's just time relative to challenge, okay? And on the y-axis for the top figure, it says ultrasound score three plus. That's the percent of calves that had low bar pneumonia. And I've just shown you images over here of what an ultrasound score three or higher calf can look like. So pretty significant pneumonia. And so here, the dark gray calves are our saline treated calves, the light gray bars are the same, are the antibiotic treated calves. Before challenge, so minus one day, then the calves were challenged, there's no pneumonia in those calves. And then we take samples or we take our ultrasound measurements two hours, six hours, 12 hours, and then once a day for 14 days after that challenge. And what we can see is the saline treated calves and the antibiotic treated calves, they both develop pneumonia um, can be as early as six hours, but by 12, 24, 36 hours, we're seeing a large proportion of calves with low bar pneumonia. Okay, so you know, roughly 70% of those calves had severe pneumonia at that point. But then we see the proportion of calves with low bar pneumonia drops precipitously between day two and day five and day six in those antibiotic treated calves. Now these calves would have been treated um, right around the 12 to 24 hour time point, their first time of treatment, they would have gotten treated once a day for three days. So by day, let's see, one, two, three, by day four, everyone probably had their antibiotic at that point. But we can see the proportion of calves with severe pneumonia is going down and then it stays low. So there are only one out of 17 antibiotic treated calves had severe pneumonia at this point, six, seven, eight days later where you can see during that same time period, the saline treated calves really didn't have much of a diminishment of their low bar pneumonia, stayed pretty consistent throughout the study. And so when we first saw this, this looks great for ampicillin. This looks like, hey, ampicillin is doing a good job. We're getting a significant improvement in the percentage of calves with severe pneumonia um, in the first few days of treatment. Okay? But what we saw here, because we continued to monitor these calves with ultrasound, is that around day nine, we started to see an uptick again. So that by day 14, we actually could not tell a difference between treatment groups and the percent of calves that had low bar pneumonia. All right, so good early impact of the antibiotic, but we had a relapse here, okay? So and when you look down in the bottom figure, this is a percentage of calves that had clinical disease. A couple of things I want you to take away from this is that there was not nearly as much clinical disease as there was pneumonia. You can see the bars are much shorter here on the clinical disease figure compared to the pneumonia figure. And the response is very variable, right? It's hard to say, um, see any pattern between one group looking better than the other. Sometimes the saline calves were higher. Sometimes the um, antibiotic calves were higher. So if we had only done clinical picture for this study, we would not have been able to see any pattern of pneumonia where by using the ultrasound, we could see the progression of disease, the onset, we could see the resolution of disease, and then we can see the relapse of disease. That is the power of using ultrasound that you can, with detail, measure the changes in the lung in response to an intervention like this, okay?
Again, these are what some of those lungs look like at the end of that study. So significant pneumonia despite treatment. And when we looked at cultures of those lungs on day 14, the percentage of calves that had culturable, so live pastoral maltosida in them was not significantly different than the calves that were not treated. So we gave antibiotic, but we did not result in improved bacterial standpoint in the lungs, okay? This is PCR and the same samples. Again, similar. We see similar amounts of PCR positive calves, whether they were treated with an antibiotic or not, okay? We repeated this study several times, uh, or repeated this challenge model several times. Um, and you don't need to know the difference between the blue and the, and the yellow bars. But what you can see here is, again, we bumped the, the dosing up. We went to the high end of the dose, the long end of the duration. But we still saw a relapse in these calves. And then it wasn't until we went to twice a day, which is off-label, which you have to talk to your veterinarian about doing, um, did we see a re relapse of disease not occur. So my take home point of these slides and this information is that not only does subclinical disease exist, all right, treatment failure exists, but we can't always see when it's happening because the calves are subclinical the whole time. Okay, so we can get some response and then we can get some relapse without, happen without knowing it's happening. If we use the ultrasound, we can figure out what treatment protocol works best for our calves. Okay, we have objective evidence to say we need to do this treatment protocol, okay, instead of just guessing. When the companies that made the antibiotics that we have available to us were studying them and were figuring out the dosing protocols, ultrasound wasn't a thing back then, using lung ultrasound. It was all based on clinical science. It was based on the presence of a high fever or the presence of difficulty breathing um, or depression, right? So the dosing strategies that are on the labels for these drugs aren't intended or don't necessarily focus on treating lungs, treating infection at the lung level. So that's why we need to use the ultrasound now on your farms, on your operations to really figure out is what we're doing actually working, right? This is a field study um, where we really showed the same thing. These calves um, were scanned twice a week, um, every week until about 52 days of age. When they had their first bout of respiratory disease, a little more than half of them were clinical, a little less than half of them were subclinical. By the time they got to weaning, only 15% were clinical now, but we had 65% of the calves that were still subclinical despite being treated. And, and to make this picture even worse, so 80 per, these, all these calves got treated, 80% of these calves got treated twice, 65% of these calves got treated three times, right? So they went Draxin, Batril, new floor. Okay. So good drugs. I'm not throwing any drugs under the bus here, um, but we could document relapse or reoccurrence or just continuation of a case of pneumonia, um, even though now it's gone subclinical when we use that ultrasound, right? And why do we care about, about that when calves have subclinical disease at the weaning period, more likely to become clinical in the post weaning period. And this is a lot of disease to still have present when a calf has been treated three times already, right? So three courses of antibiotics, 80% of the calves still have pneumonia. Okay, So you gotta figure out, is this happening on my farm, right? If we're just going based off the clinical signs, we still have a lot of false security that things are doing okay, right? And again, knowing whether or not these calves wean clean, um, is important. I'm just going to go through some slides here to show you in a, a real dairy um, what their treatment looks like when we have started weekly scanning. And what I want to show you here is just how volatile um, lung lesions are, right, from week to week to week to week. Okay, here's pneumonia treatments by month, again, up and down, up and down. Initial distribution of age at first treatment, that is, um, this was going to be prior to initiating lung ultrasound um, into their program. So you can see that calves were getting treated around a month of age. When we implemented um, lung ultrasound on a weekly basis, we could see that now calves are getting treated by about 10 to 20 days of age. All right, so using that lung ultrasound in that commercial setting, scanning the high-risk calves every week, we're able to bring the um, treatment age down from, instead of 35 days, we brought it down to 20 days. And 
calves are growing better, they are less likely to get pneumonia in the post weaning period. We're using a lot less drug because we're treating small calves, all right? So I think I am beginning to run out of time. I just want to just quickly um, touch on something here. And I know this is about respiratory disease and using lung ultrasound. Um, but when it comes to raising these calves, the impact that the gut has on the lungs, I think, is astronomical on most dairy farms. So I think in general, as an industry, we are far too comfortable with abnormal manure in these seven to 14 day old calves, right? Rhoda, Corona, Crypto, Salmonella, we say every farm has them. Probably, but not every calf should have it and not every calf should have abnormal manure. Any abnormal manure, and the calf can be bouncing around its pen, but any abnormal manure, these calves are more likely to have abnormal lungs within the next couple of weeks. So it's really important. Make sure you understand what your calves look like from a manure consistency standpoint. When I go to a farm to work up a pneumonia issue, I often end up working up a GI problem, all right, because it goes undetected in so many cases and it has such a strong relationship with the onset of pneumonia that if I can just fix calves so they don't have abnormal manure, I usually don't have to do anything and the pneumonia takes care of itself. Passive transfer is the same way. Make sure you're adhering to the new standards um, for passive transfer, raising the bar, getting 70% of your calves above 5.7, 40% or more of your calves above 6.1, you will see an improvement in your lung diseases, in your lung lesions. Um, and we're going to get there by making sure calves get four liters of colostrum in the first couple hours, and then a, by a tube and a second meal by bottle, by nipple bottle at about 12 hours, all right? Uh, keeping that environment clean, is extremely important. I don't have time to finish going through all of these slides, but from the first point where that calf comes into the into the world, whatever it comes across on the way to the calf barn, wherever it lives, we need to make sure that the environment and feeding equipment are extremely clean. I put this up here because I think this is an extremely good resource for producers. This is from Dr. Jennifer Van Oss. We collaborated with Dr. Socket um, to create some fact sheets that she has available on her website um, under Animal Welfare at CALS, Cals in at Wisconsin. Um, six or seven different um, fact sheets. The hygiene one goes through in detail how we think calves environment and calf feeding equipment should be clean. This is really important. We can use a luminometer to make sure that it's working um, effectively. And so sorry to kind of rush here at the end, but we do need to make sure that in order to keep them breathing easy, right, we have to of course, use the ultrasound to make sure that we're, we're detecting disease, but use that ultrasound to know when problems are starting, know when management failure is happening. And where does management failure happen? It can happen before birth, right? It can happen when we get too many animals calving in at once. We don't have enough space in maternity. The bedding gets dirty. The calves get dirty when they're born into that. Um, at birth, right, they can be born into that dirty environment. We cannot meet our passive transfer goals, we can have them cold stressed. And then after birth, making sure that they're growing at least a pound a day in that first week, regardless of weather. We need to make sure we're feeding enough, feeding enough volume, feeding enough pounds, um, making sure that we're doing it consistently, the same meal, the same way every day, deep straw bedding, jackets as needing, cleaning appropriately, and monitoring, using that wean clean routine to figure out when disease is starting and whether or not things are working properly um, to prevent um, the antibiotic pressure on the calf biome. So with that, I apologize for kind of rushing through the end. I'm happy to take whatever questions there are. All right. Thank you, Dr. Olivet. Um, before we get started uh, with the Q&A session, we'd like to share a brief video. Every expectant mother knows that what she eats impacts her baby. And now, research shows that is also true for our cows. Maternal consumption of Reassure during late gestation had a positive effect on the in utero calf, setting her up for better health and potentially even higher milk production once she joins the milking string. Learn more at balchemanh.com launch and launch your herd for life. As a reminder, you can still submit questions through the Q&A tab at the top of your screen. Uh, Dr. Olivet, our first question comes in from Stephen. 
And he's asking, what is your goal for treatment success for a specific treatment protocol with only one treatment? How should we assess if our treatment protocol is effective? Yep. It's a really good question and take a couple of things into account. First, we want to make sure it's the first time the calf has been treated. Okay. And what my recommendation generally is that we go to a farm or your vet goes to the farm and I'm not sure if you're a veterinarian or producer or a nutritionist, but um, the vet gets to the farm, gets a list of calves that were just treated for the first time today or yesterday, scans those calves, figures out what their scores are. And then they're going to come back the following week. So come back seven to 10 days later and rescan those same animals, rescan the ones that were treated for the first time. And again, see which ones have improved, what percentage has improved. And I would like to see 70 to 80 percent of those calves. So most of those calves to have significant um, improvement in their lung scores. So in, in down to almost zero. So if, even if they're score five, it's the first time they've been treated and it's not chronic, meaning they're not small. They don't have thin top lines. They haven't been treated already a bunch of times. If it's a new case of disease and a young preween dairy calf, I expect 70 to 80 percent of those calves or more to have almost normal lung scores seven to 10 days later, maybe up to 14 days. All right. Very well. Next question comes in from Duarte. Um, how can you assess the cranial pars of the cranial lobe? Do you have the textbook pictures for the different ICS that I can use as guidance? Yeah, I'm just going to, um, can you guys see my screen again? Yes. Mm -hmm. So when we watch, uh, what I want you to see when, when Austin scans this calf, she gets, let me just fast forward a little bit there. Just gonna put the alcohol on there. The key um, to, first off, the key is knowing your landmarks. Each rib space has a specific ultrasonographic landmark that tells you where you are. So you don't have to count spaces. And so when we're, for instance, I'm going to show you on this right hand image here. Let me get up there. So uh, there we go. So in this first image on the right hand side where I see these vessels, I know I'm in the first rib space. Okay, it's a little hard to get me to stop. There we go. We have lung, it steps down and around these two vessels. Those are my landmarks that tell me I'm looking at the lung lobe in front of the heart, the right cranial, cranial lung lobe. And the way you're going to do that, you can see Austin's hand is on the side of the calf's chest. That right cranial, cranial lobe, the first rib space is way up underneath that forelimb. So he's going to push his hand up underneath the triceps of that calf. So up underneath the elbow in order to see that, but he's going to watch his landmarks as he goes from rib space to rib space to rib space to be able to see that, that spot. Calves, pre-weaning calves, they're pretty flexi bendy. So adult, it does take some effort to get up there. It is possible. An adult cow, we are not going to be able to get up to the first rib space from going behind the arm like that. We're going to actually have to come in front of the leg to see that rib space up front. So if I play this normal image again, I'll show you this is one, this is one rib space. This is a, probably the sixth rib space. This is a fifth rib space, fourth space, third space, second space, and first space. So just by um, looking at the landmarks I see on that screen, which I'm not telling you what they are right now, but um, we know where we are. If you go, I'm going to stop sharing here for a second. If you go to our Dairyland Initiative website, um, Google Dairyland Initiative website, um, Calf Help Module, Wean Clean, I have a training video there that will go through all of the landmarks and provides videos and shows you how to do the actual technique. It does take some hand holding, um, and it's not something that I would expect somebody to be able to do without somebody that's already been trained working with you to do that, because it's really easy to see what you want to see on an ultrasound, and you don't want to um, misdiagnose a calf with bad pneumonia just because you don't realize you're actually looking at the liver. That has happened. Calves have died and been euthanized because the veterinarian saw a liver on ultrasound, not realizing the landmarks they were looking at were incorrect. So there is um, any of my materials online or you can contact me 
um, or have your veterinarian contact me. I'm happy to help figure out how to get you trained. All right. Thank you. Um, Dr. Olivetta, I see we've uh, crossed the top of the hour. I want to be respectful of your time. Do you, do you have a few more moments for some more questions? I have plenty of time for questions. No rush. All right. Very well. Uh, next question comes in from uh, Jose. Uh, Jose. Um, how many days after calving should I start with the ultrasound protocol? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, part of my, I should have put up a slide for my wean clean protocol, but one component of that wean clean protocol is that we do what's called 12 by seven scanning. Okay, 12 by seven scanning means we take 12 calves at seven days of age and scan them, 12 calves at 14 days of age, 12 calves at 21 days of age, 12 calves at 28 days, all the way through till weaning at one visit and we see the proportion of calves that have pneumonia within that age group, okay? Now, most calves, if they're indoor housed calves, you're gonna see a, a, uh, the development of pneumonia um, around that 14 day age group, or maybe at the latest, the 21 day age group. So seven days will have zero, then 14 days, maybe you'll get 20% or 25%, 21 days you might have 60%. Um, so I use that seven day staggered, um, kind of windows to develop a bit of a point prevalence to figure out when disease is happening. Now, if you feel like you're dealing with a post weaning problem, you don't have to start at seven days of age. You can say, well, I, I treat calves at 90 days of age. Well, back up a few weeks and pick your 12 calves that are 60 days old, 12 calves that are 70, 70 days old, 12 calves that are 80 days old, where you can find where is that uptick? Where is that onset of disease? Um, it'll be different for every farm and every operation. Home-raised hutch calves outside, they can be very late in the pre-weaning period before you start to see disease, or you might not see any disease because they're outside. They don't have much stress if they're fed well and everything well taken care of. Sourced calves that are hutch-raised outside, they have similar levels of disease as indoor individually housed calves, right? So kind of next tier of, of lung disease, and then your indoor group house calves will have the highest level of disease and the earliest onset. So it depends a little bit on the operation where you'll find that onset of disease. All right, next question is from Stan in practice. Would you recommend treating calves with LS2 or do you only treat uh, LS3 uh, pneumonia or higher? And then there's a follow-up question. Could treating animals before they reach uh, lobular pneumonia help improve cure rate and prevent relapse from occurring? Yeah, great, great question, Sam. So um, in practice, my standard recommendation is that if we're finding disease early, so we're routinely scanning calves that are at risk, so 14 to 21 days or 21 to 28, whatever the age risk is, risk age is for that farm, um, the rule of thumb is going to be score two. And a score two means they have at least one centimeter for the whole lung, one centimeter of consolidation. If they have one centimeter or more, they've never been treated before and they're a young pre weaned calf, our data says treat them. Our data also says treat them if they're clinical, even if they don't have lung disease. So don't forget, you still have to look at the calf. Um, yes, if you get a calf treated when they're a score two, they are much less likely to become a score three calf. And that's the best treatment response we get is when we can get them treated at a score two. So one centimeter or more. All right. Um, one, I, I just will add one thing, because if you start doing this, you've got to be you've got to realize if you're a veterinarian or if you're the producer, if you start finding disease sooner and you're using a more sensitive tool, you might panic when you see the list of calves that need to get treated after you start doing this. Don't panic. The disease level hasn't changed. You're just finding them now. All right. But they're going to perform better after you get them treated sooner. OK, so so be OK with that. Be prepared for that. And if you're a veterinarian or somebody that's going to be doing the scanning, make sure you warn the operator that this is going to happen so they don't get scared by saying, oh, my gosh, we have twice as much disease. Okay, for every clinical cap out there, we can expect two to four subclinicals. Okay. Marion would like to know if most of the veterinary clinics in North America, um, if, if, if they're using this protocol. Uh, so I, I, I see the question here with the veterinary clinics of North America. It's a journal. It's a it's, oh, a, okay. it's a book out there. Yep. And yes, um, look in the 2016 um, Vet Clinics of North America. And I have a chapter in there that I wrote with Sebastian Buczynski. That's got the technique. It's got the scoring system. It's got different ways to use it um, in that. And then I think in there's another Vet Clinics um, 
2020-ish, maybe, where we actually, I did a review looking at housing types and its association with pneumonia. So not directly related to ultrasound, but gives you a little more information on, on housing prevention of pneumonia. But that 2016 Beck Clinics will have the technique in there. All right. Very well. Um, I think I was telling you before, Dr. Olivet, that I, I first heard about you while I was at the Western Dairy Management Conference and was speaking with a veterinarian and uh, and a dairy farmer. And and they were very excited about using this tool to um, diagnose uh, damaged lungs and then being able to pre predict or, or call animals uh, before they got into the milking stream. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, about that? Yeah. So what we do know, um, if a calf has... Our data would say that if a calf has ultrasonographic pneumonia, just three centimeters, that's not very much at all. In the first two months of life, she is going to make about 1,200 pounds less milk, 525 kilos, depending on where in the world you're coming from, um, first lactation milk. So it's a substantial, substantial amount of milk. It's interestingly very similar to the amount of milk lost when calves don't grow as well. So good work out of New York shown that if calves don't grow as well, they don't make as much milk for lactation either. I think the rule of thumb there is about 1,500 pounds for every pound of average daily gain um, that you will lose in that first lactation. So 1,500 pounds, 1,200 pounds, very similar. My guess is that the reason those numbers are so similar because calves that didn't grow very well in that New York study probably had subclinical pneumonia, right, driving that. So there is that long-term performance um, deficit that's going to happen from these calves that have pneumonia. Now, because a lot of some farms have 60 80 percent of the calves that will develop pneumonia we can't get rid of all of these calves right but we can do what we can to manage it and control it and minimize it um, the more severe disease they have probably the bigger milk loss is going to happen um, in the west coast um, folks that are using lung ultrasound regularly they're using it more as a culling tool later on so they can find animals that are performing subpar um, or have you know been treated multiple times or still have chronic lungs, and they're going to cull them, you know, at four or five, six months old versus keeping them um, all the way until they um, come, you know, get pregnant, get bred. Um, if they do keep them, we do know that these animals will get bred later. They will calve in later and they will be more likely to have dystocia. So there are, uh, and be less likely to make it to their first lactation. So have these long-term impacts of having disease, ultrasonographic disease in the pre-weaning period. Um, so you've got to decide for you and your operation kind of what question you want to answer. Do you want to use it as a culling tool? Um, it can be used as a culling tool. And what I usually say is I, I don't say, well, get rid of every score five calf. Well, you might have a lot of score five calves and you might not want to get rid of all of them. Um, but you may have a batch of calves that you need to make room. You're going to figure out who's got the worst lungs and get rid of them first. Um, I think lung lesions trump genomics, right? If a calf is your highest genomic calf, but she's a score five and she's been treated four times already, she's not gonna meet her genomic potential, right? It's, it's there. Um, in our adult cow study that we did, it does not appear as though the lung lesions stay with that animal until she calves in. We often say, oh, she had terrible lungs as a calf and then she kind of peters out after she has her calf. I think that is some epigenetic engineering and printing that's going on. Um, I, I think the switches have been flipped when she was a baby calf that determines her survivability later on in life. I don't think it's because she still has consolidation in her lung. I don't think that's why she fails when she calves in because most of those cows, their lungs actually look fine, even though they had terrible pneumonia as a calf. Most of these lungs will clear up, but whatever genes have been turned on or off during calfhood is what's causing that cow to not be a productive member of society later on in life. All right. Well, Dr. Olivet, that's going to do it. I want to thank you. This has been a very interesting webinar, and I'm looking forward to continuing the uh, conversation on our upcoming podcast. I also want to thank everybody for attending today's webinar. If you have additional questions, please submit them to anh.marketing at balchem.com. The Real Science Exchange Lecture Series of Webinars continues on June 20th with a companion animal topic titled, Raw Meat-Based Diets Are Upon Us. How do we ensure their safety? And that'll be with uh, Dr. Greg Galdrich and Samuel uh, Kipratik from uh, Kansas State University. Our next ruminant webinar is on August 1st with the uh, Not All Rumen Protected Products Are Created Equal featuring Dr. Clay Zimmerman. And then on September 12th, 
with the, uh, a presentation titled The High Fertility Cycle with guest speaker Dr. Paul Fricke from the University of Wisconsin. Visit balchem.com slash real science for more details and to register for all future webinars. Balchem's podcast series continues to offer a deeper dive into our webinar topics. Log on to your favorite podcast platform and search for Real Science Exchange to visit Balchem, uh, to visit our um or visit balkim.com slash podcast. If you want a really cool Real Science Exchange t-shirt, just subscribe to the Real Science Exchange. Send us a screenshot along with your shirt size and your address to anh.marketing at balkim.com, and we'll get that right off to you. And on behalf of Balkim and Dr. Olivet, thank you for joining us today. <music>